All right, can you guys, can you hear this? All right. It's always great to be the last session before the party though. You know, so, so let me personally compliment you for taking the time to come here, okay? It's gonna be an interesting session today. Uh, it's actually gonna be a panel, you know, so I have the pleasure of being the moderator. Uh, my name is Raghu Yeluri and I am part of uh, Intel's data center group. And I work on security and uh, one of the things at Intel we've been trying for the last four or five years is to actually create a new manageability control for security called trust, okay? And uh, trust could be, you know, uh, could have very many facets to it. And uh, one of the challenges is once you know trust, once you have that trust, how do you measure it? How do you monitor it? And how do you do any remediation based on it? Okay, so today we have uh, three pretty uh, uh, accomplished panelists with me. We have Fred Lima here, he's the chief security architect at Visa. And uh, you know, he's been driving a lot of the security initiatives at Visa. We have Joy Durairaj, she's the senior security product manager at HP uh, Enterprise for the HP Helion product line. And we have Prasanna, who is the CEO of a very interesting startup called Cloud Rack Shack. Okay. Uh, we, the way the panel is going to work, each of the panelists are going to spend five minutes uh, with Fred starting on, hey, what are the objectives and requirements for advancing trust in the clouds and what uh, the visa perspective is a little bit. Then uh, uh, we're going to transition to Joy, who's going to talk about how HP Helion is building uh, what are called uh, compliance building blocks to take advantage of uh, any hardware root of trust capabilities in the, in the x86 platforms so that they can make those building blocks available for monitoring and compliance tools. And Prasanna is gonna uh, spend five minutes on how they use these building blocks to bring it all together and we'll actually show a demonstration of how you can take some of the security controls that are relevant for PCI DSS and how do you monitor them and how do you do compliance on top of it. Okay, with that, I just want to start with one slide before I hand it off to Fred, okay? Cloud security means so many different things to different people, okay? If you are a consumer or a developer of cloud, you just care about apps and data that run on top of the cloud. If you are a private cloud or a, a cloud provider, you care about the middle two things. You know, how do I secure the platform, the cloud platform, and how do I secure the infrastructure, which is uh, security under the cloud, okay? If you deal with multiple clouds, private clouds, and you know, hybrid clouds, then you have to deal, about, deal with security across clouds. And finally, there is a category of products that are emerging which are beginning to offer security as a service. So they run in the cloud, interestingly, but they provide uh, monitoring of security controls, uh, evaluation against compliance requirements and remediation from the cloud. Okay, uh, in, you, you're gonna hear from the three panelists in uh, the, the four bottom categories, okay? The one that the, panel, the three panelists won't cover is the, the secure applications and data. That's what uh, you know, uh, IT shops and enterprises are gonna do but I think the panelists are gonna cover the bottom three, bottom four, okay? With that, I wanna hand it to v, uh, Fred to kind of give us, uh, you know, what are the requirements for the, the, sec the security requirements for the financial industry, and you know, what are, their, what are the objectives that uh, they drive towards for advancing trust in the cloud? Thanks, Rugu. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm trying not to stay in the way of the party, that's for sure. So, um, <clears throat> so um, we're, here, we're here pretty much talking about uh, what is that uh, we want to look at when we think of advancing uh, trust in the cloud. Um, when we think about Visa, um, a leading company in the payment technology industry, we are definitely looking um, very closely what's going on in cloud technologies. Given the, all the business advantages that um, we are looking at in terms of scalability, agility, uh, and so on and so forth, that's definitely something we need to keep an eye. With OpenStack, it's no different. 
and given the commitment that we put in building our um, environment towards uh, uh, cloud enablement, uh, of course, secure becomes a topic of, uh, of concern in terms of how we want to make sure that things are properly secure, um, how we want to make sure that things are addressing the needs of um, compliance reporting and compliance measurement. So um, to that, um, I wanted to first uh, talk a little bit about uh, um, the word trust, just expanding a little more on what Raghu alluded to. Um, and um, if we just, we, we could, uh, as, he, as he well pointed out, trust could mean uh, different things for different people and different uh, standard bodies have slightly different definitions of what that means. But if I could just leverage what the Trusted Computing Group uh, uh, defines and alludes to when, the, when uh, talking about trust, uh, think about trust as something that can be anchored to a hardware-based attestation uh, root of trust. So establishing a root of trust based on hardware. Why is that important from, uh, from our perspective when looking at um, advanced trust in clouds? Um, it is important given the fact of what the new, this new paradigm we're living with. So yes, it is about agility, it is about uh, uh, flexibility and scalability, but what are the things that are taking place in order to make that happen from a cloud infrastructure perspective? Today we look at uh, these different uh, um, use cases where you have a hypervisor-based infrastructure or uh, container-based environments uh, running on top of bare metal OS, um, we deal with uh, uh, um, uh, VNF-based uh, network services. We deal with uh, security functions that are also based on uh, uh, NFV type of deployments, uh, storage volumes. Uh, and at the end of the day, given uh, what the cloud is pushing us towards, we also need to consider uh, the fact that this flexibility also means that our workloads um, need to be properly um, 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 identified uh, from a location perspective <coughs> or tagged from a location perspective. Um, so some of the challenges and things that come to mind when you think about establishing a par this paradigm from a secure paradigm in terms of advancing um, trust in clouds are those questions that you're seeing in, uh, in the slide. So how can we really make sure that we uh, maintain, that we establish some level of measurement and we maintain the integrity of the cloud infrastructure. How do we um, also can establish integrity and maintain uh, it um, for the workloads running on top of, the, um, of that infrastructure? In addition to the location, uh, or uh, knowing the location of the workloads and from a geo perspective and be able to uh, uh, to apply policies based on that location. The ability to, again, establish and, and leverage the a root of trust to establish uh, attestation of integrity of that software that's running on top of, uh, um, of the cloud. Now, of course, what it comes to mind is uh, compliance. A lot of times for a lot of folks here in the room, at the end of the day, one of the things that we need to establish, sometimes I like to think that way in terms of reducing complexity or compliance is what sources of truth do we need to rely on establishing some level of compliance monitoring and reporting? And to that effect, um, a single hardware-based route of trust seems to help us towards those, uh, uh, those objectives. And at the end of the day, uh, what is that we want that we can enable from a remote attestation um, uh, perspective? So I don't need to be there to know that it is really uh, tied to where it's supposed to be from a hardware perspective. Moving along then, we come to these um, uh, higher level security objectives, not really fine grain detail security requirements per se, but security objectives that we feel can enable us to work towards advancing trust in clouds. So uh, a little bit of what uh, we've talked before, but just to reinforce the, the ability of us to provide assurance uh, and workload integrity of the, um, uh, of the cloud infrastructure and the workload, um, the ability to enforce uh, residence, residency of the workload and data from a location perspective, the ability to protect the confidentiality 
of the workload that's running on top of the cloud. And then, of course, as we mentioned, having ongoing compliance verification. We have this high-level conceptual view of an architecture in which we would leverage that hardware-based root of trust. We would leverage some of the plugins into that root of trust in an API fashion um, to establish a security con and compliance control plane towards that, yet in alignment with the cloud control plane. In our case here, with the OpenStack control plane. So with that, I'll pass um, the mic to Joy, who is gonna talk about HP's approach. Sure, thank you, Fred. So at HP, um, when we talk to customers like Visa who are in the payment technology industry and have um, you know, requirements uh, about uh, compliance, it resonates very well because we have not only heard from customers in, um, in the financial uh, space, but also customers from other vertical industries um, such as you know, healthcare or, um, or whether it's um, service providers or whether it's um, you know, government agencies and so on. So we recently did a, a survey of uh, over 250 uh, C-level execs um, and uh, director level and above and um, using 451 research, and uh, this was a qualitative and quantitative research sponsored by um, uh, a, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So the results were not surprising at all. I mean, uh, what it is, is it uh, basically says that, you know, ensuring compliance with regulatory and policy requirements is still the number one concern from a, a security standpoint in a, when customers deploy hybrid cloud. And uh, having the visibility um, and um, the cap capability to monitor what goes on in their environment, given the nature of uh, the uh, rapidly changing uh, cloud environment, they, they, the problem is that drifts happen very very quickly. And being able to monitor for those compl drifts, compliance drifts, is very, very critical for, law, for customers across all spectrum of industries. And um, the next thing is that um, you know they also want to make sure that uh, there is consistent policy controls enforced throughout their infrastructure. So whether it's you know starting all the way from hardware root of trust to you know the networking uh, layer, or whether it's a hypervisor layer, or if you're going to the OpenStack and then uh, on to the application layer, they want to be able to have a very consistent uh, way to. Um, 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 a very consistent way to enforce policies across their environment. So that's critical for our customers. Now, when it comes to compliance, the, the key questions that our customers are asking is, how do I remain com uh, you know, compliant in an open stack environment? Um, and um, how do I automate? Automation of compliance is a, critical, is a, is a huge headache for many customers. And the problem with that is, you know, you have um, you you have uh, different um, you know systems. You have different uh, layers of the stack, um, all giving out you know different formats of lo audit logs and whatnot. How do you standardize across, and how do you make sure that you know you're you're automatically checking for drifts? And that's an important aspect. So c quite the c common example will be you know when you're running um, say. Um, uh, 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 VMs on your guest node for the guest operating system could not have been patched for several months. And how do you make sure that your patching policies are staying up to date? Uh, the other aspect is tenant isolation. So how do you ensure that your tenants are properly isolated? You've got the appropriate security controls in place and so on. And, and most importantly, the end-to-end -end compliance is critical. And so what we have in, at HP is we have the basic building blocks. So we have our ProLine you know, hardware servers. They come equipped with uh, TXT and TPM modules. And so for us, the, the being able to take advantage of that is very, very um, critical and beneficial for our customers. And being able to um, integrate with vendors like uh, Intel to bring together and also you know, integrating with uh, Cloud Raksha um, to bring together an entire solution that will do not only you know hard end-to-end um, -end compliance, but starting with the hardware root of trust is critical. And um, so we talked about you know I already uh, had talked about the different layers and being able to um, um, ensure that you're compliant across the entire stack. And um, so when you look at the entire stack, starting with the hardware root of trust is very very important. And um, um, so with the, with our, the um, um, modules that we ship with every uh, ProLine server, we are able to take advantage of it and provide the basic building blocks. 
And um, so here is a great example that shows, it's a diagrammatic um, representation that shows how the, um, the hardware root of trust um, actually works in an open stack environment. And um, the, uh, essentially what it is is the, um, you know, the plugins that Intel has developed and open source uh, and um, allows the NOVA scheduler, allows the uh, NOVA to intercept the requests and make sure that the uh, hardware root of trust, the certification or the attestation, uh, the integrity that uh, Intel returns and use that integrity to basically you know, uh, run enforce security policies. So security policies are things like, you know, don't allow my users to run, uh, you know, spin up VMs if the server is not um, attested by uh, uh, Intel or not certified by Intel. Likewise, you know, if they're not belonging to a particular location, and this is this is important from a data sovereignty perspective because you've got compliance needs where, you know, your example would be, you know, European compliance laws where, you know, c companies operating out of France, they don't want, you know, uh, users uh, to run via um, uh, the workloads if they're not based out of France. So things like that, we are able to take advantage of by using the basic building blocks from HP, Intel, and Cloud Rakshak. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Prasanna for his um, for Cloud Rakshak. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Joy. Uh, so clearly, as Fred pointed out, there's a bunch of requirements for compliance and security management that come along with the field of trying to do regulatory uh, uh, workloads. Joy talked about all of the various components that are available that from which you assemble an overall solution. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about how these things come together in order to create from the root of trust a long-term story starting from the time at which you start the process all the way through the end of life of any assets that you're creating on top of OpenStack and making sure that the compliance with your desired state is not only present but is provable from an audit perspective to auditors who are interested in the state over the entire life cycle. Uh, as we all know, earning trust is hard enough, but once it is earned, it has to be maintained, and it has to be maintained and proven so that over the entire life cycle of the assets that you're building and using, you have a consistent sto uh, story, right? Now, the interesting thing is if you go out and these customers that Joy was talking about, if you actually query what it takes to do this in today's environment, about 40% of the cost of managing cloud applications is worrying about all of these issues around security and security compliance. Time and time again, we've gone out and talked to multiple customers where that is the benchmark number that we're hearing. It's a very significant piece of the operational cost. And so bringing that down through a process of making security compliance simple and making it automated so that there are no escapes from the process is what brings you to the point of being able to prove to auditors that you are doing everything in order to maintain a consistent security posture, right? There are multiple key things that you have to worry about when you're talking about security compliance. First of all, what are the rule sets that you are applying? How is it that you are convincing somebody that the entire set of things that you're doing fits into the industry best practices to be able to satisfy requirements like Fred was talking about? So one of the things we do is we start with standard, well-accepted security postures such as DISA's mission critical stigs. For those of you who are in the security community, you know that that is a very rigid set of compliance mechanisms that you can bring to bear. The second is you integrate it into the overall process of setting up your clouds and then setting up the, the assets, compute assets in the cloud, like spinning up VMs, and making sure that these postures are applied immediately upon the creation of the assets and then checked by automation continuously throughout the life cycle of the process. And to do it in a way that is a one-touch provisioning process so that even the s most novice of users of the infrastructure will be in a position to do it and will be in a position to do it without error. And I'm going to show you in the demo how all of that stuff comes together. Now, this is obviously built on top of the variety of things that Joy was talking about as building blocks. We start with the hardware root of trust and with the stuff that the Intel CIT technology, particularly the 3.0 version that it brings to the table, that is available on the HP hardware in the uh, ProLiant Gen 9s and beyond. We start with that to validate that at the time of creation of an asset, 
the actual posture of that asset is actually measured by the hardware which is irrefutable in a way that you can then build on and then extend that, those measurements over the life cycle of the asset to repeatedly check it and in a consistent and standard reporting structure, think of it as audit ready logs that you can then take and show to your auditors that from the time of creation, automatically with no escapes, all the way through the life cycle of the, of the assets, there has been a consistent policy applied. Now why is that important? Even though you may start with a root of trust and start at the time of asset creation with a posture that you understand, drift happens. As you all well know, in a development or in a DevOps kind of environment, changes are being made to the system as you experiment with it, as you do the development, and changes do happen. So detecting those changes and automatically remediating the posture as you go is very important. Right? The overall architecture that we bring to the table uh, involves that block in the middle which talks about the variety of things such as the actual rules that we apply, which is, uh, in our case, what we're demonstrating today is the NISA, I'm sorry, the, the DISA NIST rule set. A, a mechanism by which the service that we offer comes in from the outside, reaches into the assets, reaches into the control nodes and the compute nodes of the OpenStack environment to ensure that the, co the configuration of those nodes themselves has not changed, and then reaches into, as I showed in the previous chart, the assets that are being spun up, the VMs that are being spun up on OpenStack that register back with the service and get checked. I will show you a quick demonstration of this. Uh, how are we doing in time? Okay, good. So the first piece of the puzzle is setting up the hardware correctly. So looking at what Intel CIT technology brings to the table is a way to use the TXT and the TPM, which are the hardware components that are available in the Gen 9 servers that Joy mentioned, allows you to tag assets in a way that is guaranteed by the hardware as being immutable. Let's say with interesting things like the geolocation of where those compute assets are, or other properties including acceptable kernels or acceptable BIOS, and then all the way up to the, to the VMs that you're gonna spin up in OpenStack to make sure that the signatures of those VMs belong to a whitelist that is forced and checked by a hardware root of trust chain that starts from the hardware and works all the way to the launching of the assets, right? So what this screen shows is how in the Intel Cloud Integrity Technology console, you are able to tag the various machines that you are spinning up as uh, compute nodes and assign them properties that are then used. Oops. Where's the rest of them? Okay, that was a short demo. Now this tells you why continuous compliance is important. This is drift. Everybody's wondering when the party starts. Okay. Yes, that was supposed to be the next slide. <laughs> so uh, once you have done the tagging that I showed in the previous screen, what happens is that in your standard OpenStack uh, environment, the various, for example, in this case, compute nodes that are available have now been tagged, and that tag has been measured and validated by the hardware, right? So let's see what happens when you now spin up an asset on this platform in which the various compute, compute nodes have been tagged with, let's say, geotags, as Joy was showing, the entire uh, perimeter control or the border control uh, uh, use case, right? So you would launch an instance exactly as you would launch it normally, right? You would go, you'd pull down the right set of things, and as part of this entire process, the CIT technology would then look at the tags that are associated with the VM that you're spinning up and say these tags say that this VM has these following requirements, it should be placed only on hardware that has the following geotags, right? The second thing is that as this asset spins up, 
as this asset gets created, what we're showing over here is that you can actually tag it with the kind of compliance checks that you want to run on that asset, not only at the time of creation, but over the life cycle, which in this particular case, we are specifying as a post-provisioning script. What that post-provisioning script does is as the asset comes up, first of all, it's been checked that it is legal to run on certain set of platforms, and that's what it's gonna run on. But then it also goes ahead and auto-registers with the compliance service and says, I'm alive, this is the compliance properties I want you to run, and the example that we are showing is of running a PCI DSS compliance check, and so that's what this use case is. Run me, and run me periodically uh, throughout my life cycle, right? So now we're going into the Cloud Rakshak, uh, our services dashboard, where the system has already come in and registered itself, and if you look down into the machines that are being managed, you will see that highlighted light green bar over there is the machine that was just spun up on the, uh, uh, in OpenStack. It's registered with the system, it said hello. And now you, we automatically run the security posture that we were expecting or that the machine asked for when it got created. In this particular case, it was the PCI DSS compliance rule set. It's about 109 rules that we apply and you can see up in the top right in the console, it says we've got 109 rules that were run, of which 63 were successful. This is for demonstration purposes. We're showing you a use case where the actual CentOS machine that was spun up was a brand new build of CentOS just downloaded from the OpenStack CentOS uh, web page. It itself says that about 50% of the rules out of the box are not set correctly. This is why paying attention to compliance is a big deal because out of the box, your machines are not necessarily configured the way you would like them to be, right? So uh, you can go into the rules, you can take a look at what the severity of the rule is, you can get, take a rule, and as I said, these all trace back to the disastigs, which is what we are applying. We can, with, although we're not demonstrating it here, auto-remediate any changes that are found and go back and fix the configuration setting, not only at the time of creation, but throughout the life cycle if anybody made any changes to it, right? And so we can manually remediate, we can go click on the particular rule and say go fix it for this machine. Uh, and eventually, at the end of the day, we generate reports, and as I said right at the beginning, uh, we can produce a compliance-ready report that can go as become part of your audit package, and so this, once you do that, now what this leaves you with is a complete check all the way from hardware. So this is actually a hardware check that reaches back into the Intel CIT technology, pulls out the attestation and the quotes of the machine that your workload is running on, and the quote, uh, the actual structure of the compliance that we ran on the machine, puts it together into a single consumable audit report that then spans the life cycle of the overall system, right? So I think what we're showing is that by putting all of these building blocks together and taking the requirements like Fred laid out, you can actually build an end-to-end -end system that gets you audit-ready compliance, not just of your OpenStack assets, but of the assets that you're creating and running on top of OpenStack. That's the story. Okay, that's kind of cool here. So uh, let me uh, open it up for questions. So let me kind of start with, uh, with, uh, with a couple of questions so that you know, see the see the discussion a little bit here. So, Fred, uh, I know you can't talk a whole lot about what you guys do at Visa, okay? But can you give us a flavor of where you are in this whole trusted private cloud journey at Visa? What can you share? Sure. Um, so, what um, what uh, what we've seen um, is um, an evolution. Um, and uh, we've been uh, working on with this paradigm for several years in before um, um, cloud came to play as far as how we um, enable our hardware-based root of trust. It's a paradigm we live with in several areas of security, specifically to uh, virtualization platforms before uh, those were quote-unquote clouderized. That's something we've been, we've been doing some work for quite a while, enabling uh, Intel TXT. Now, uh, with OpenStack coming to play and the commitment for us to secure that uh, platform, um, we, we're trying to establish uh, the, the baseline from which we want to enable all the good things that come with cloud, as we mentioned before, the flexibility, the scalability, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, 
going forward, um, the, I think what, uh, what we would like to see or anticipate is um, um, uh, as the developers get more and more interest into putting uh, different types of uh, workloads uh, on top of the cloud in, in runtime environment, how can I enable enforcement um, at the runtime level in addition to us being able to um, evolve to uh, a plugins to security solution from a control plane perspective. What I mean by that is developers have their own uh, um, um, uh, preferences in terms of uh, um, uh, container uh, control planes or what containerized con uh, control planes or whatnot. Uh, with the amount of control planes coming to play, um, what does that mean? Where you have maybe the open stack control plane and maybe some other control planes at the container level. Um, from a security perspective, how can I minimize the complexity um, in terms of us uh, 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 building this journey uh, and still advancing the trust, but again, uh, um, trying to minimize the complexity caused by this uh, uh, quick advance that developers are, are marching towards. So, you know, don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have an ask for the OpenStack community in this regard? So um, um, I've, I've seen, I've, I've been uh, paying attention to uh, a little bit to what's going on in, uh, in um, OpenStack, Magano, container, container as a service, um, and how this, is, uh, how this is evolving to, which is a good thing. Um, what, um, and we, this is a development conference, there are developers here in the room, uh, OpenStack developers. W when I said developers early on, I was referring to the business application developers who work in the enterprise. So they are not, inf they may not be infrastructure savvy, and they don't care, and they don't want to be, right? And when they want to deal with a, a, a control plane that enables them to do what they want to do, um, uh, how can we make that happen? And yet, in the background, um, we, from a security perspective, can keep an, can keep an eye on, on what's going on. At the end of the day, the hands may be moving from a centralized infrastructure team to the tenants themselves uh, so that they can do what they need to do. Um, so my ask would be, um, try, uh, my ask would be to pay attention to this paradigm in which the, the, the application, the business application developer community uh, is asking to leverage uh, similar, the same tools as the infrastructure team is asking for. So uh, that's, that's, that'll be my ask. All right, thank you. So Joy, uh, I know you, know, you had a pretty good walkthrough of uh, HP Helion and the building blocks. Can you comment on what time frame the, the, these building blocks for security, you know, the whole hardware assured compliance as you called it, when are they going to be available uh, for folks to access? Right. So we recently um, launched um, Helen OpenStack 3.0, literally went out this week. Um, that's, the, um, that's one of the building blocks for this particular solution. Uh, we absolutely have uh, want to um, you know, make this broadly available. We, right now we're working on um, um, POC demo and then obviously uh, uh, a solution for Visa, but uh, we, will, we definitely have plans to bro broadly productize this. Um, I would say you know, we want to target end of this year. Okay, thank you. And Prasanna, for you the tough question, okay? Okay. Uh, I know at the end of the day, the compliance controls and the whole remediation and enforcement happens through a product like yours. Okay. Uh, there are efforts in the industry, especially in the OpenStack world, through Congress. Okay. What's your ask? What would be your ask as a compliance, security compliance vendor? What would you like the community to do more so that it makes your life a lot easier? More than our life easier, I think, what can we do to make the community's life easier, right? So okay. it's what, what two things, if the community can do, that would be very valuable. One is we need to share broadly the kinds of experiences we have, the kind of profile sets that get past regulators, industry by industry. So if there is a collective belief or collective knowledge that gets created, saying that for certain use cases, 
here's the set of profiles or here's a set of security postures that regulators find acceptable, we should share that knowledge. Because collectively, we are better off as a community with well-accepted best practices, where those practices are accepted not only by the practitioners, but by the regulators who are overseeing the practitioners. That's the first ask. Make sure we do that broadly. The second is, no matter what we as vendors do in this space, there is a certain set of underlying code that OpenStack itself brings to the table. As much effort has to be paid to making that code security conscious and following best security practices as anything that we can overlay on top of it to offer other security capabilities, right? So the building blocks that Joy mentioned, starting from the hardware on up, including the kind of efforts that HP is doing with Helion, are in, in hardening Helion and making sure that it is a reliable and security conscious set of uh, building blocks is very important. And so recognizing that at the end of the day, no matter how user friendly the overall OpenStack system is, if it is not something that we can prove to our auditors that it is following best practices and is reliable and trustworthy, people in regulated industries cannot use it for production. And we've got to start from there and work our way backwards as opposed to building something that's usable and then worrying about how do we make it hardened. All right, thank you. Now we've got about five minutes, I believe, so let me see if there are any questions from you, from the audience to any of the panelists. We can't see it. There's yeah. so much. So once you start talking, we know that somebody's lighting. asking yeah, us a question. I, have a question. So um, I think, uh, Joy, you mentioned, uh, I was at your earlier presentation as well, uh, HP Helion 3.0 yeah. uh, is uh, PCI compliant. Correct. So is that a convert solution, or is it just the software aspect of it? Because I would imagine, because the hardware is the root of trust, for example, so there's a hardware dependency. Uh, does that make sense? Or you know, what if I took it on commodity hardware and installed it? Do I still, uh, can I, uh, can, I uh, can I make the claim that it is still PCI PC compliant? Actually, it's an excellent question. First of all, I wanted to thank you for that. Um, so the first thing that I did want to you know, clarify is with uh, 3.0, uh, Helion OpenStack will be PCI ready. And uh, there's a difference between, you know, PCI ready and PCI compliant. Uh, because when, you, when we say PCI compliant, then, you know, we have to go through the physical and uh, procedural and administrative controls, work with an auditor and get it certified. So that responsibility will still lie with you as a customer. And um, so when we say it's PCI ready, the, what we mean is that, um, first of all, we had worked with an external audit firm who did the uh, validation lab assessment and the readiness for us. And they went, literally went through you know, 250 plus controls uh, with uh, Helion OpenStack and said, yes, we do satisfy the um, controls that we are responsible for. And um, so that's the key difference that I wanted to highlight is, you know, obviously the software distribution uh, will not be able to satisfy physical controls like data center, you know, closed circuit TV or um, you know, security guards or biometrics. Those are still you know, valid requirements from a compliance standpoint. Point. Now, <clears throat> back to your question. So, if you were to take, say, you know, three auto, put it in a converged um, architecture, put it in a converged hardware, and then run through the controls. Um, so, you can use our guide to guide you through those requirements that we satisfy. Uh, but then keep in mind that there are requirements that you will need to satisfy as well. You will need to configure it in a PCI compliant manner. That is very key. Um, and you will also need to obviously work with an auditor that will uh, um, you know, say yes, good check box and tick mark and say, yeah, yeah, you've met all these things. Um, a small example of that would be, you know, let's say you're, you're supposed to implement uh, firewalls. Um, so we give you all the, um, you know, the neutron um, capabilities that come out of the box with OpenStack but it's important for the customer to be able to configure it in a compliant manner. So there's subtlety there, but yeah, very good question. Hope I've answered your, uh, addressed your question. Right, uh, we got a minute or two left, so maybe one more question. Uh, I want to throw one more thing, FIPS 5 Fourier 2 support. 
Yeah, so FIPS uh, 140-2, this is um, uh, generally, this is required for federal uh, agencies. It's a very, very, you know, involved um, set of uh, requirements um, going all the way uh, across the stack. Um, we do uh, want to address that sometime, um, so we are definitely, you know, wanting to target it, but we are not FIPS ready yet. Right, uh, I think uh, maybe, okay, one more question before we, we wrap it up here. My question is for Fazan, and uh, I agree with what you said earlier about it should be a, like a community effort to come together um, to basically standardize uh, our way to um, satisfy the criteria from all these standards. I personally went through, so I, I work for Microsoft. I know here I'm not the bad guy, but um, I actually did it, went through the same validation uh, with FedRAM, exactly like uh, HPE uh, did for PCI. So. Um, and we also had an uh, external uh, 3PO during the process. So my, what I learned is basically there is a lot of gray area on how you can address the, same, the very same criteria. So you can, and then sometimes also a dance between, oh, it's a technical responsibility versus a, it's a, co a responsibility on the customers, it's a responsibility on the process and so on. So uh, how would you go after um, creating this common knowledge because I mean, I agree with the intent. Uh, I don't know though how we could come together and do this because uh, then when you start going to the details of the implementation, there are a lot of forces going in different directions. Like yeah, sure, and I think exactly it's a good question. Exactly as what Joy was saying earlier is that the, a lot of these standards leave a lot of things in the physical realm, in the administrative realm, in the process control realm uh, that are simply not addressable from a technical perspective. But at a minimum, the things that you need to do from a technical perspective are probably common, right? And even there, I think, so for example, if you go and look at the, the SCAP stuff or if you look at the DESA stuff, those are all building blocks from which one starts, right? Uh, creating a better way to share that is like the, the question that Raghu asked me is what, what is the ask? The ask is that we as a community need to set up, set up to it, right? Any trials that we do, any uh, you know, proof cases that we build out. Let's find ways to publicize that because that's the only way we're going to learn from each other. And if there is a community-wide, we've done 10 of these trials with this exact same set of uh, constraints and that has gone through 10 different auditors, that's a very good thing to know. Without which, you know, everybody is an individual trying to drive what they are doing through their particular audit set and trying to get past it. Uh, that doesn't scale quite frankly, right? Which is exactly what your experience that you were talking about. All right, hey, uh, I think we have no more time for questions, so if you want, we can be available for a little bit uh, to talk. So I want to personally thank the three panelists, Fred, Joy, and Prasanna. Thanks for taking the time, joining and speaking here today. Okay, and thanks everybody for joining. Enjoy the party.